ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ director of the institute for comparative literature and society uh, at columbia she will be formally introduced by dr ayaz ahmed who is presently a fulbright visiting scholar at columbia uh, and he is a professor at the united world school of law at karnavati university gandhinagar gujarat concluding remarks will be given by dr chinneya jangam associate professor in the department of history at carleton university ottawa canada and you know uh, this topic is uh, becoming more and more interesting ambedkar is back in india these days um, and surprisingly he is promoted by the icon of congress party who has somehow forgotten ambedkar for a long time and rahul gandhi is having a constitution in his hand banging every indian every corner here is the book and here is the writer of that book author of that book so welcome you all ambedkar studies between history biography and theory and now i invite dr azamat for a formal introduction of anup mara hey yeah, sir thank you rajesh sir thank you so much uh, jai bhim adab to everyone joining from different continents for this uh, program today uh, <clears throat> so as part of the introductory remarks uh, i am to introduce professor anup anupama rao uh, but also to give few comments introductory comments on the subject which is very very close to my heart uh, <clears throat> over the last few decades Uh, ambedkar studies has emerged as one of the most productive resources to counter hindutva politics at a time when hindutva is uh, threatening to devour the democratic dreams and aspirations of a billion indians ambedkar's democratic scholarship offers hope and courage uh, to so many of us Uh, ambedkar's brilliant theorization of the graded inequality prevalent in the indian subcontinent and caste as an enclosed class and the enclosures being secured through social cultural political and legal practices opens multiple doors and windows for enriching and de- deepening democratic ethos theoretical and practical implications of uh, these insights graded inequality and caste as an enclosed class i think uh, the the full implication of these uh, insights are yet to be understood and realized <laughs> although recent attempts to read ambedkar with gramsci uh, are quite interesting very promising in my view ambedkar i thought dovetails better with post marxist and post structuralist uh, structuralist traditions uh, and it is the marxism that has evolved over a period of time to converge with ambedkarism uh, rather than the other way around uh, on the lighter note this is why i think that the that the evolving slogan is now jai bhim lal salam rather than lal salam jai bhim i think if india is to be saved from a certain chaos and violence which hindutva promises to unleash on majority of the people then ambedkar studies must acquire the center stage in all our resistance efforts ambedkar's life and work not only dissolve hindutva logic by a ruthless critique of its brahmin savarna proponents but also unravel its sayyad ashraf support system baba sahib breaks free from the hindu muslim binary propped up by the savarna ashraf hegemony to lay down the foundation for united states of india one of the expressions that he used in his uh, uh, his, his submission to the constituent assembly united states of india 
the Sambedkar studies offer a very holistic and rounded ideological infrastructure for the realization of liberty, equality, fraternity through constitutional democracy. Ambedkar's journey from the particular to universal, from the particular to the universal, is a role model for all particularistic struggles for dignity, security, and prosperity. No one is more qualified to speak and explore these themes from the Ambedkar studies than Professor Anupama Rao. She is the professor of history at Barnard and Misas Columbia University. She's director of, of the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society at Columbia and has spent over nine years as senior editor of comparative studies in South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. She's completing a monograph titled Ambedkar in America and the Cambridge Companion to Ambedkar, which are slated for publication very soon. Professor Rao recently introduced and edited memoir of a Dalit communist, The Many Words of R.B. More, published by The Left Word in 2019. She edited Gender, Caste, and the Imagination of Equality, published by The Women Unlimited in 2018, which was a sequel of source to 2006 volume titled Gender and Caste. She directs the Ambedkar Initiative, whose vision includes situating Ambedkar as a global thinker and among the 20th century's most important voices in the radical democratic tradition, engaged pedagogy, and public outreach. Most of all, it aims to re revitalize the links, both implicit and explicit, between the world's oldest and the world's uh, largest democracies. Question marks at their present status notwithstanding. As a matter of fact, I uh, met Professor uh, Anupama Rao and uh, the larger Ambedkarite community in the New York region in one of the many events which uh, have been organized through the Ambedkar Initiative at Columbia University. In addition to writing numerous papers and essays, she is the author of the book titled The Caste Question, published by the University of California Press in 2009. It is a work of social and intellectual history, which has received critical acclaim for transforming the understanding of the relationship between caste and democracy, and for its contribution to political thought and history more broadly. The book centralizes Ambedkar at the heart of human emancipation project, and how Dalit emancipation is umbilically connected with the redemption of global democratic project. Professor Rao sharply brings out the connection between caste radicalism and the making of a new political subject. She vehemently questions equating India's modernity with the politics of anti-colonial nationalist consciousness. In this process, she also exposes the limitations of the subaltern school's claim of non-Western democratic historiography. Professor Rao highlights with great passion the role of anti-caste democratic struggle in transforming the meaning of rights, equality, and citizenship and re-signifying them as, a, as universal values. She exposes the hollowness of Brahminical norms and values with a sharp pointer to their democratic poverty. Her characterization of the secularization of the Brahmin power as a state power is incisive to the court. However, she does not ignore multiple and often contradictory outcomes of the Lithi Emancipatory Project. Professor Rao underlies with great empathy how Dalit militancy has been offset by a new formation of anti-Dalit upper caste violence, be it physical, social, economic, cultural, or political, or even legal. Uh, mutation of anti-Dalit violence into anti-Muslim violence also find uh, expression in her work. Her theoretical insight that the form of democracy is closely connected with the recognition of the forms of inequality that define a social order at any given point of time, nudges us to pursue the rights and recognition towards an interesting expansion of the field of politics. Uh, the book urges to undercut analytical distinctions between the social and the political, and the religious and the secular, in order to liquidate the political unconscious of the Indian society based on caste, and gender. My work at Columbia University has been influenced by Professor Rao in many interesting ways. Uh, interaction with Professor Rao and her, her book, The Caste Question, uh, have been catalytic in the development of my thoughts and ideas at Columbia. 
It is my honor and privilege to invite Professor Anupama Rao to reflect on embedded studies between history, biography, and theory. Jai Bhim, Jai Samidhan, over to you, Professor Rao. Jai Bhim, uh, Lal Salam, <laughs> and uh, thank you very, very much indeed, um, Ayaz, for this extraordinary introduction and I think reading of the work. Um, one is only as good as one's interlocutors. And uh, I really want to thank you. I'm honored by, by the reading that you've provided. And I'm also looking forward very much to the comments of my fellow traveler, uh, Jangam Chinnaya, who will follow on my comments. I think as Ayaz, um, Ayaz has pointed to some very important issues. One is the question of caste's relationship to, in a sense, social totality, right? Everything from the existential to the ethical questions that we confront today. Second, it seems to me, and this is something that he brought up in his comments, the work that we do, indeed, if we are going to think about something called Ambedkar Studies that is both emergent and incipient, it is work that needs to be collaborative with many modes of reading, many forms of interpretation and engagement, deep discussion, dialogue, and even perhaps um, conflict over the kinds of debates uh, and interpretations, excuse me, that we bring to this, to this work. I'm gonna start and um, read if uh, you don't mind, because I'd like to stick to time. And I just want to begin again by thanking Razi and his team for hosting this event to the many people who are here, uh, who I cannot see. And so in some ways, one's thoughts and words go out into a world and one is not sure who is listening. Uh, but I thank everybody for that fellowship. And again, as I said, I want to thank Ayaz and uh, Chinaya well in advance for um, all their labor and engagement mm -hmm. with, uh, with the work. We write and reflect in very difficult times indeed. And as I think about contemporary India, Modi's India of Dalit atrocity, Muslim lynchings, the arbitrary arrest of students, the ongoing assault on the poor, the agrarian crisis, I am tempted to ask following on a, a set of comments that Ayaz made actually, I'm tempted to ask what would the origin of Indian democracy look like if Contrary to the uh, conventions of nationalist historiography, we were to think of the 20th century history of the subcontinent as a history of the minority subject. Today, as Muslim communities are ghettoized, boycotted and bulldozed, they experience a near total exclusion from, total, uh, from political power. Meanwhile, Dalits are vulnerable and excessively visible to the state. Insurgent mobilization and persistent demands for rights notwithstanding, social exclusion and violence are key mechanisms by which their visibility is manifest and caste privilege reproduced. If excision from the body politic defines Muslims' relationship to the state today, Dalits are marked by forms of negative sociality, a term that I've used before, that is practices of prejudice, humiliation, and corporal violence, which structures the relationship between Dalits and the touchable castes, to use Ambedkar's term. Dalits and Muslims' relationship to Hindu majoritarianism, it seems to me, is structured by competing inequalities shaped by complex and non-linear histories of connection, comparison, agonism, and otherness. These shape the post-colonial politics of the subcontinent as much as they characterize its millennial history. And it seems important to begin by acknowledging this broader context, even though this is not really where the rest of the talk will go, so that we do not end up provincializing the question of caste again or privileging various forms of identitarianism. In my own work, as Ayaz noted, I have been interested in the social ontology and the historical epistemologies of caste, what it is, which is connected with how caste comes to be known. That is the relationship between word making, the politics of naming, defining, and categorizing on the one hand, and world making, the struggle to put ideas into practice on the other. How was it, by what means, through what practices of activism and intellection, did the complex forms of inequality that we call caste come to be seen as fundamental to the imagination of freedom and equality in India? 
What is more, how is it that those who have historically borne the brunt of untouchability, the most invidious example of the continued violence of caste, how did they become central to the story? Through what histories and practices of self-fashioning, engaged, autonomous, worldly, insurgent, have they altered mainstream narratives? So first, it seems to me en route to thinking about Ambedkar studies, there's a question about caste as a category and as a social analytic. And then there is the worth attendantly of focusing on the limit case, on the outcast, she who is within and without, apart, apart, but who functions as well as a proxy of the caste whole. It's well known that caste has been equated with the Indian social to core. It's been attributed to deep-rooted religious conceptions and sh shared beliefs, such as of purity and pollution, the persistence of endogamy, and rules regarding contact and cleanliness. It's also recognized now that the reification of caste was in fact a result of colonial era knowledge production, whereby theory arrives first and shapes actual social practice. This is not to say that caste is singular and unchanging, or indeed that it's a colonial invention. On the contrary, caste's historical transformations are extensive. They range from the emergence of regionally distinct castes associated with militarized pre-colonial regimes, Marathas, Reddis, Kammas, Rajputs, Jats, and so on, to caste's analytic utility for colonial governance and strategies of indirect rule, and the role of caste in structuring labor relations, the appropriation of surplus, what we might call the political economy of caste. However, a widely acknowledged telos of transformation, one that's a variant of dominant distinctions between culture and capital, we, could, we might note, assumed that caste was backward or particularistic, that it would dissolve into the universal with progressive development, and the onset of modernity, capitalist modernity. Scholars of South Asia responded by historicizing caste's social pertinence and its analytic, analytic centrality, but their efforts also had the ironic effect of rendering caste merely into a form of subcontinental difference, a manifestation of hierarchy that contrasts, let's say, with the idea of equality as societal norm in the North Atlantic context. It's interesting to see this play out in popular works that press for historical comparison and for reanimating caste, such as Isabel Wilkerson's book, Caste, the Origin of Our Discontents, which compares India, the United States, and Nazi Germany as societies of caste. Uh, this is a recent but hardly novel endeavor to compare societies organized around stubborn and peculiarly insidious forms of heritable hierarchy. However, Wilkerson's book came on the heels of the murder of George Floyd in the United States and the globalization of the Black Lives Matter movement. And it's thus catalyzed con conversations about global racism, certainly here in the United States. Now, Wilkerson's inversion of race as a transhistorical signifier in favor of caste's more capacious itineraries is noteworthy. I have many problems with this book, but I think this is a very important point. Can we ignore that one system predated the formation of states and the other was imposed by state power, that is caste and race, or that one predated capitalism and the other emerged during its peak? What is caste's history? How can it be both archaic and modern? And does caste operate like other forms of hierarchy and difference? Or is it indeed the instantiation, the very imagination of hierarchy, as was argued, for instance, by the now infamous Louis Dumont? I'm suggesting here that by thinking caste and race syst uh, systemically and comparatively, as with other categories, we ask about distinctions between equality, difference, and hierarchy. That is, these are questions about the value and the limits of comparison, what it can produce, but they're also historical questions. They pose questions about the historical, the social origin of categories, the, uh, the uh, ephemeral, you might say, convergence between categories, and the broader arcs or itineraries of unfreedom and inequality 
and how they allow us to write, one might say, counter global histories. So the appeal here of drawing analogies, exploring connected histories, and looking across place and time to compare subaltern social experience is inextricably tied to both emancipatory impulses, that is forms of solidarity, really to expand the kind of multitude, the political and progressive multitude on the one hand, but also how we understand the force and the power of social explanation. And anti-caste thinkers like Ambedkar are noteworthy in this regard, partly because they, like others, Foule, Periyar, and many others, argued that the caste question could be viewed as an iteration of quite general processes of inequality and subordination. That caste was potentially commensurable, looked like, resembled, not absolutely identical with, please note, other forms of social difference and distinction. For instance, race or even class. And today, as both Razi and I think uh, Ayaz have noted, Ambedkar is claimed by everyone, by the right, the left increasingly, of course, and by the long tradition of Ambedkarites who have claimed him in many different ways. He has indeed become the political thinker extraordinaire, and we now have a growing body of work on Ambedkar, close readings, the intellectual influences on him, movement history, biography, and so on. But he's also an icon, a symbol of political possibility. Think indeed of that constitution in Rahul Gandhi's hand, but more importantly, it seems to me, the women in Shaheen Bagh, the farmers' movement, student protests. So here we have a very important archive of public memory that's available through sound, song, visuality, and indeed through an affective embrace and intimacy with the life worlds that Ambedkar made possible. If we don't link the conceptual and the perceptual, as it were, by bringing these two domains of thought together, it seems to me that we ourselves do a kind of great injustice to both the kind of collective memory of Ambedkar, but also the ways in which we might think about a project of intellectual excavation, of um, you know, thinking about his political thought. Now, my own interest in political concepts and the systematic character of anti-caste thought lies in taking seriously the dialectical entanglement between historical structures and categories of perception in order to account both for the emergence of certain concepts as standpoints of critique that are often in excess of their temporal location. Let me call it thought that is out of place and for the imminence right, of thought within historically determined or locatable sociopolitical and intellectual fields that is thought in its time and place. And in some sense, we could think about the kind of near and far readings of Ambedkar, Ambedkar in his time, but also Ambedkar in our time. And I think that is the kind of project as well of a robust, capacious Ambedkar studies. And so I'm interested in Ambedkar's inquiries into the social life of caste, one that produced an extensive archive, at once systematic and recursive which persistently queries, as I've noted in my abstract, the gap between legislated redress and existential suffering. In other words, it's important to bear witness to Ambedkar's enduring preoccupation with the ontology of caste. In the half hour or so that I have now, I'd like to uh, work through a reading of Ambedkar's first publication, Caste in India, their mechanism, genesis and development. It was first written as a seminar paper, as almost all of you know, for Alexander Goldenweiser, who was himself a student of the anthropologist Franz Boas. And this is a text where Ambedkar, the young Ambedkar, approaches caste as a way of organizing the totality of social life. Now, we might recall that the origin of caste as a system or structure is a story not of social complementarity, but of dismemberment the dismemberment of a complex whole. Let's call it society. Here, the metaphorical social whole is imagined as already separated and divided. It's given form through the parceling of body parts associated with social function. Think here of the or, uh, story of originary man, Purusha, in the Purusha Sukta itself, a late addition to the Rig Veda, and itself the result of ensuing debates between caste as birth, and caste as the product of human action and occupational labor, karma, or doing, 
a recent work by Kanad Sinha really speaks through the recensions of the Rig Veda and the late edition of this Purusha Sukta and the kind of ideological function that it plays. But what's important here is that the Purusha, the, this, um, this um, portion of the Rig Veda approaches the body through a set of social functions. The Brahmin is born from the mouth of Purusha, the Kshatriya warrior from his arms, the mercantile communities, the Vaishya spring either from his belly or his thighs, and of course the laboring majority emerge out of Purusha's feet. The outcast is here, invisible, we should note. The homology between social function and body part is predicated here, I want to suggest, on a mutilated whole. The body politic from the get-go is torn asunder. It is divided at its origin. And caste, what we call caste, refers to the mechanism by which communication between castes, touching, must be established either by consent or more often by imitation and violence. And indeed, it's this asocial sociability of caste, which Ambedkar, the young Ambedkar, brilliantly theorizes and to which I now want to turn. Ambedkar, just a couple of quick uh, locating points as it were. Ambedkar was at Columbia, New York at a fertile time. He's there between 13, 1913 and 1916. The modern social science disciplines were just beginning to take on clear definition at the University at Columbia at the time. And when uh, ideas of historical comparison, the analysis of social systems, the force of social democracy or social democracy itself as an idea to challenge indeed uh, Marxist notions of uh, sociality and, um, and the working classes and the significance of the culture concept were all being shaped by interdisciplinary methods aided by institutional traffic between social science, social work and progressive, that is to say anti-racist and anti-war activism both at the school, at, uh, at the university, and in the city at the time. But this was also a period of intense debates about Hindu immigration and citizenship, in, in uh, citizenship, excuse me. The US was seen as a particularly welcoming country for students, unlike Britain with its imperial color line. But by 1916, a judge in California who had ruled that Hindus were eligible for citizenship if they could prove that they were of a certain caste recognized as white, that dominant idea that caste and Aryanism right, went together was already in danger. He drew upon similar rulings made in the U.S. District Court in Washington and a federal judge in San Francisco who determined that Indians of the better class were full members of the Aryan race. This is in 1916, drawing on the racial anthropology of former Columbia University lecturer W.Z. Ripley. As you well know, probably, Indians were later stripped of their citizenship by a Supreme Court case, U.S. versus Bhagat Singh Tind, in 1923, which ruled that Hindus were non-white and therefore non-assimilable. And so here already, it seems to me, we're beginning to see, and there are many, many other instances that I can't go into here, but that the kind of race-caste complex or the caste-race complex is being mobilized in many different ways, in policy and legal contexts, in intellectual arguments and debates, uh, and perhaps the best known would be the ways in which uh, W.E.B. Du Bois from 1903 begins to use the term uh, racial caste and by the time he's writing his very important book, Black Reconstruction in 1935, talks about what he calls color caste and makes an argument that he has perhaps been the most important interlocutor of the caste concept and the one that has used it most perhaps profoundly um, or intellectually, seriously, rigorously. So this is just a little bit of background for thinking about caste in India. And let me place the basic details for our discussion before us now. And this will be a reading of Caste in India, and I apologize, it is a close reading and somewhat dense. And uh, I will um, really try to stop and uh, modulate, but uh, just a warning. Now we we'll learn here as we go through this text that Caste's negative sociality is a product of the peculiarity of internal division, the partitioning of the whole. The social whole here is internally divided because, Ambedkar will argue, caste is fissiparous. The whole is so internally divided, it is neither the sum of its parts, nor can it represent them. These parts, that is, castes, 
are agonistically related to each other through violent separation, and they're, all, they're also pulled together by the force of imitation. This, Ambedkar will argue in caste in India, makes caste different from race, which is an effort to aggregate different racial groups, partly because of the distinctive suture of sex and the social that actually produces or gives caste its analytic uh, valence and, uh, um, and, and kind of productivity. So like other social formations, caste is a relation of relations between social groups, and Bitker will argue, in this case, castes themselves. Unlike race, which poses the problem of finding a unifying mechanism for territorially differentiated and culturally distinct groups, caste is a partitioning of the social whole, and it presents us, Ambedkar will argue in this text, with the sociological puzzle of understanding the relationship of part to whole. How are different castes related to this dominant system or structure that is also given the name caste? Let's call it caste in, uh, in, um, uh, you know, in capitals. So if Hindu society, Ambedkar argues, were a mere federation of mutually exclusive units, the matter would be simple. We would bring them together. But caste, he tells us, is something quite distinctive. It's a parceling of an already homogeneous unit. And the explanation for the genesis of caste is the explanation of how this parceling came about. That is how the whole came to be internally divided. I am, of course, thinking here about the sociological Ambedkar, the one who's interested in the question of group formation, how and why it occurs, and the forms it takes. And Caste furnishes our young student in this 1916 essay with a peculiar yet productive example of the formation of social class. The logical operations of complementarity, opposition, separation, repulsion, and encompassment are each at play when we approach caste as a relation of relations. So when Ambedkar defines caste as an enclosed class, something that Ayaz also referred to, and argues, and if he, he, he defines caste as an enclosed class and argues that the study of the origin of caste must furnish us with the answer to this fundamental question. What is the class that raised this enclosure around itself? This is the Brahmin who raises the enclosure around himself. Endogamy, the proscription of everyone marrying everyone else, is the mechanism underwriting this enclosure. In fact, what we call caste, and Baker reminds us in this text, profound argument, is that caste is endogamy by another name. That is, caste does not exist without it being a way of suturing, as I've said, the relationship between sex and the social. It didn't used to be this way. Indian society, Ambedkar will also tell us, saw the imposition of endogamy and exogamy in the deep historical past. And it is this doubled structure, exogamy, a relatively open order, on which a order of endogamy is imposed that makes caste internally unstable. Endogamy, the stricture of marrying only within one's caste, is both the essence of caste and its mechanism of perpetuation. And the imposition of endogamy, this way of controlling procreation, reproduction, and indeed the name of the father, we might say, and lineage, was enabled by imitation as the basis of social reproduction. So if endogamy is the inside of caste, imitation is the outside, we might say, of caste. Imitation re is repetitive and it's fated to uh, fail. However, it's unable to breach that first enclosure, the charmed circle that the Brahmins built around themselves. And I think here in this early text, we do see Ambedkar thinking about Brahmanism as a very complex form of psychosocial power. The originary parceling of the social occurred when Brahmins created or became a group within a group. And from there, it was the infection of imitation that turned the other castes, non-Brahmins, into endogamous castes, who also began to enclose themselves because of the absorption of the pernicious logic of caste, which is here both a logic of parceling and a commitment to endogamy. 
Ambedkar cites two laws in service of this psychological explanation for the spread of caste via imitation. First, he explains that imitation flows from the higher to a lower, and that this represents the replication of Hindu practices, especially the pernicious annihilatory practices of uh, sati, enforced widowhood, um, and girl-child marriage, and so on and so forth. The second law of imitation can be stated in this way, and this is the graded inequality, the graded hierarchy, that again, I think Ayaz mentioned as one of the deep contributions that Ambedkar makes to the ways in which we can think in a more capacious and more complex way about the questions of inequality, equality, and hierarchy. So the second law of imitation can be stated in this way. The intensity of imitation varies inversely in proportion to distance. This can be understood simply when paired with the first law of imitation. That is, as imitation flows from higher to lower, the closer one is to the most superior caste, the more practices they imitate wholly, uh, the, the more practices they imitate wholly to spread caste by what Ambedkar calls infective imitation. So those castes that are nearest to the Brahmins have imitated all three customs and insist on the strict observ uh, observance thereof. Those that are less near have imitated enforced widowhood and girl marriage. Others a little further off have only girl marriage. And those furthest off have imitated only the belief in the caste principle. This phenomenon, Ambedkar argues, is a illustration of the law of imitation that he draws on by someone called Gabriel Tard, um, who was taught and whose book, The Laws of Imitation, was actually translated by a young Barnard Columbia student by the name of Elsie Clues Parsons in 1903. So here, Ambedkar is drawing on Tard and others. And again, please keep in mind, I'm thinking about the ways in which the early, the incipient disciplines of sociology and anthropology uh, and the focus on the sociological group allows and affords Ambedkar a way to think about caste in a more capacious and perhaps in a glo more global manner, right? He's thinking about caste as good to think with as a case study, an example for the broader question of how society, the social and sociality gets made and is produced, right? I, I saw a note that uh, people might have a hard time hearing, but I also see that it seems to be fine. So I'll keep going. Um, so now, if caste can be minimally defined as equivalent to the principle of endogamy, and caste stands for the social to core, maintaining this introduces an instability in the system, one which is of both historical and sociological interest and exploration for Ambedkar. Right? And here enter the problem of surplus woman who threatens caste as group formation from within. Right? He understands the problem of surplus woman as a consequence of enforced endogamy, observing that the problem of caste resolves itself into one of repairing the disparity between the marriageable unit of the two sexes within it, right? So caste is a form of controlling for this. The commitment to endogamy, which is irrational, I think Ambedkar would argue, produces a set of attendant dilemmas about how best to satisfy the need for reproductive heteronormativity within each caste. There's no biological mechanism by which to control for reproductive parity between an equal number of men and women, right? Or that may an equal number of male and female children are born at any given time. There's also the problem of one spouse dying before the other in a kind of perfect uh, and homeostatic system uh, where endogamy is working. So here the logical problem of measure and equivalence is translated into how to maintain the couple form, one that's menaced by both the presence of surplus woman and surplus man. However, surplus woman poses a double danger. She can marry outside caste, violating the rules of endogamy. She can encroach on the chances of unmarried woman within her caste. And therefore, the entire logic Ambedkar tells us of how caste endogamy is to be maintained, the entire force, the violence falls on uh, how we control surplus woman, how we can make sure that she's degraded, and I quote, to a condition in which she's no longer a source of allurement. So this imposition of social death on surplus woman is what makes it possible for her to no longer be a sexual threat 
to other women of marriageable age. It's clear here that endogamy can't be enforced in practice without resolving the problem of surplus. That is endogamy and surplus, regulation and excess together organizes Ambedkar's explanation of caste as inherently unstable, as somewhat schizophrenic, not merely artificial, but also illogical and enforced by intimate violence. If kinship is the hinge between nature and culture, between savage sexuality and regulating patrilineal descent, endogamous marriage secures um, patrilineal descent, the name of the father and lineage, but it also enables hierarchical distinctions between groups. And it's for this reason that Ambedkar gives pride of place to enforced endogamy in castes in India, even as he quickly becomes aware that this functionalist position, though it's intellectually compelling, this is really like a working through of a, of a you know, marvelous structural logic if you actually think about how to map what he's arguing, he becomes very quickly aware that this functionalist and structural position is, though it's intellectually compelling, is also historically untenable. In fact, it's not true. Later, he will come to argue that endogamy was a rarity in early India. And he tasks himself, and so this is, and I want to argue that Kass in India becomes, in some ways, we see it as a kind of, you know, inaugural text, one that he keeps returning to later through his writings, one that he elaborates upon, but that it's worth thinking about this and the role that this text plays in Ambedkar's oeuvre. So he'll keep coming back to this, and later he'll task himself with explaining exactly how social endogamy and what he calls the conjugation of caste mixture gave way to endogamy. And Ambedkar will read historical transformation back in time via fossilized institutions through, the, through what we might call the social remnant. Exogamy itself is one such primitive survival. The presence of endogamy as a natural order of things is revealed to him by a continuous mixture actually of caste mixing along various axes of incorporation. So before we had caste endogamy, we had caste miscegenation in essence, which actually produced new castes. So there are uh, there is um, there is concourse we might say between Aryans, Aryans and non-Aryans, rebels who rejected Varna or those who lost ritual status, and that history Ambedkar will argue in his other work is available through philology, through emergence of new terms for the mixed castes, and Ambedkar will argue that over the course of time one might notice a hardening of Varna hierarchy and the growing stigmatization of both the practice and the product of caste mixing, the so-called bastard castes, with conquest, settlement, and the incorporation of non-Aryans into Aryan settler formation, functioning as the mode by which caste itself becomes regulatory and indeed authoritarian and violent, uh, a form of violent discipline in the way he describes in caste in India. Now we should of course think about the ways in which Ambedkar is utilizing all of the dominant discourses of the time. That is, he's thinking sociologically, he's using tools of the time, certainly questions around you know, the Aryan and the non-Aryan are, as we know now, um, deeply unsettled and unsettling terms. Uh, there are also terms of art of that time, which no longer obtain for us. So there is a kind of colonial sociology of knowledge that Ambedkar himself inhabits, occupies, and then tries to work with. And so in a sense, by thinking sociologically according to the rules of that emergent discipline, Ambedkar, I want to suggest, arrives at its limits. He will argue that caste is a strange multiplicity comprising primitive and modern elements governed by the mechanism of endogamy, while the replication of caste also reproduces a principle of separation. So what should bring us together actually operates as a principle of separation that it creates the parceling of an already homogeneous unit. Here, let me briefly just underline that Ambedkar's way of thinking then about the social question, right? Caste as a form of sociality is charged from the get-go, from this first text, because of the way he's articulating the internal division, the parceling of the social whole, the non-relation of part to whole as the defining feature of caste. 
So if Ambedkar locates the beginning of caste sociality in repetitive Brahminical violence, the disposal of surplus woman, he also thinks about Brahminism as psychosocial power, one that is predicated on the repulsion, the repugnance of one caste for the other. And I quote, while making themselves into a caste, the Brahmins, by virtue of this, created a non-Brahmin caste, or to express it in my own way, while closing themselves in, they closed others out. Let me end then with a brief note on perhaps why this text is important or why I've chosen to talk about this uh, in, a, in a broadly, in a talk uh, on Ambedkar's studies. In castes in India, Ambedkar struggles to explain a structure governed by a peculiar force of separation, fission, and division of the social whole. Twenty years later, in that more famous, better known text, The Annihilation of Caste, he prioritizes the relationship between untouchability and Hindu religion as the point of contradiction that can bring caste to crisis. As he focuses on the untouchable as a part apart, Ambedkar will argue there that Hindu society as such does not exist. It is only a collection of castes. He will suggest that the division between touchable and untouchable and the principle of untouchability itself is what effects a separation of society from itself. And 20 years hence, he will inaugurate a revolutionary project that seeks the destruction of that edifice through the return of Buddhism. Now, the historicity of Ambedkar's thinking allows him to advance two types of critical arguments, both registering the historical mutability of Hindu beliefs and practices. There, first is the origin of Buddhism in the initial defiance of earlier ritualistic Vedic orthodoxy. And second is the decline and the eventual removal from the subcontinent of the extensive structure of Buddhist institutions and practice. And this leaves, as he will note, practitioners with only two options, either obliteration and absorption into the Hindu Brahminical structure or continued defiance at the cost of the most inhuman degradation known in human history, the practice of untouchability. And so in those late texts, the rise and fall of Buddhism is described as a process of revolution and counter-revolution with the history of Hindu narration narrated as the political history of the subcontinent. These are perhaps the Ambedkars we know and the texts we uh, refer to en route to the arc of tracking his thought. But none of this is apparent when we read Kas in India, but there are intimations. In Kas in India, I want to suggest the student of sociology discovers the mechanism that makes caste cohere. He has yet to spell out the, politi the political, the ethical, and the existential implications of this caste separation, of what it means to have a society separated from itself. He's only just begun to think about the outcast, the boycotted, and those defined as untouchable and unseeable. In fact, the term untouchability doesn't appear at all in this 1916 seminar paper. But in 1916, the young Ambedkar has a growing awareness, perhaps, of this internal division of the whole, right, which will later aid his call for annihilating caste in toto. That it is the non-relationship of part to whole, the tearing asunder of the social, the mutilated whole, the social itself as a kind of mutilation uh, of, of uh, the kind of body of caste, if you will, that uh, makes it uh, clear that caste is about the parts, that is, different castes agonistically related to each other, both through a kind of violent separation, but also a um, sociology or a sociologic, we might say, which allows for castes to be pulled together by the force of imitation. And I think I'll stop here. Um, I hopefully have just gone within about 40, 45 minutes of time and uh, end just by noting that um, I wanted to offer this reading of uh, Ambedkar's earliest text in a sense to suggest that there are reverberations, there are ways in which he returns to this text. If we have the time and the chance to talk together more broadly about um, some of uh, Ambedkar's later texts but also to offer a way of what I've suggested is this um, strategy of near and far reading, 
about to think about Ambedkar in his time, this young student who is being exposed to sociology and the terms of art of that incipient discipline in his time, but also the ways in which by using the terms that he's given, Ambedkar radically transforms what ought to have been the question of how do we make society cohere into telling us about how caste is about the impossibility of the social itself. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you all. All right. So let's see here. Yes, Dr. Jango. Welcome. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, sure. Yes. Uh, Jai Beam again to uh, all of you and also, you know, uh, thank you, Anu, for uh, you know, this wonderful and also very uh, stimulating and also engaging uh, you know, presentation. And uh, as always, you know, your work and uh, your commitment always inspires people like us. And, you know, and uh, there's no doubt, you know, how you know, stimulating this talk and also how it is helpful in terms of rethinking about Ambedkar. So my, you know, uh, response to uh, Professor Rao's talk will be like, you know, two, uh, three ways I will try to situate. One is the context, I think, which uh, Ayaj Bhai mentioned in the beginning and also Anu also touched on the context of, uh, because the to today's theme about Ambedkar studies and why Ambedkar is relevant now and why Ambedkar suddenly becoming an icon of the nation as Raji pointed out you know even uh, you know Congress leader uh, Rahul Gandhi is holding constitution and going around and reminding the importance of Ambedkar and his you know work uh, in the context of uh, what is happening in India. So the first uh, aspect of this uh, you know, the context is very very important you know because I was uh, very young when you know Babri Masjid was destroyed and also the Mandal Commission. And uh, if you really want to look at the context in which Ambedkar has emerged as a very important uh, no, alternative figure to counter the Hindutva and the growing communalism. And it's very important to you know, not just look at Modi's regime, but also go back all the way to 90s, starting with Adwani, who started this you know, Ratyatra, basically inflaming the country into a communal no monster. So in that context, what happens is that you know, like we have to see the uh, the way in which the uh, Mandal Commission report implementation and the rising communal politics. Uh, in the sense, the communalism came as an you know to counter the social justice agenda. So that we should not forget. In this context, what happens is that you know, like it is in this context of the fight between the. Brahmanical majoritarianism and the social justice politics. And ultimately what happens is that, you know, the anti-Dalit violence turns into anti-Muslim violence because the way in which, you know, the whole idea that you know, Dalit Muslim and Adivasi were always outside the you know, purview of the Hindu imagination. So in this context, what you see is that, you know, the context is this, like, you know, 1989 to, you know, 2014, what you see is that, you know, there is a transformation of Indian society into a majoritarian Hindu Brahmanic nation state in which basically that's why at one level there was a gradual erosion of democratic politics and what happens is that you know like by 19 by 2014 what happens is that you no know, their mainstream political parties are not even talking openly in support of Muslim you know, about Muslim persecution so the Hindu majoritarianism succeeded such a way that you know no one even you know wants to identify with the sufferings of neither Muslims nor you know Christians, Adivasis, or Dalits. So in this context, what you see that the context is very important. So that's why it also tells a very interesting thing about the crisis of Indian democracy. It is in this crisis what happens is that you no know, radical alternative comes from Ambedkar. So like what a exhaustion of this crisis, like you no know, particularly the Gandhian ethical engagement or the politics of you know, various socialist politics and uh, all these things, what happened that they could not counter the liberal democratic politics and liberal philosophy in India has exhausted itself and uh, not able to provide alternative to Hindu majoritarian communalism. So it is in this context what happens is that the anti-caste thinking is very, very critical to counter the Brahmanical majoritarian politics. 
so therefore it's very important that you know we need to see the connection and the context because it is the crisis of indian democracy ultimately forces both academics and also non academic elites in indian society to ambedkar as a very important alternative so therefore in the context of rohit vemula's death and you know what hap what happened after 2014 and 2016 onwards is that it is the youth of the nation both dalit adivasi muslims and also you know progressive you know caste privileged people who are refusing to you know accede to it and trying to go out of their privilege and work and it is this young generation who are basically taking forward the image of ambedkar and also it is the ambedkar's you no know, ideology which is very emerging as an important alternative to not just for protecting minorities and dalits but also the very foundations of the nation so that's why why constitution suddenly becomes an important electoral issue in 2024 precisely because of this that you know the foundations of democracy are under threat and it is a constitution which needs to be protected to safeguard not just the communities but the very found nation itself so i think this is what is very important i think uh, this is one of the reasons why today's meeting like you no know, especially i see that you know lots of muslim friends and you know brothers are here and it's very important to see that this you no know, relationship dalit muslim and adivasi and minority unity is very critical to protect the constitution of india and the second aspect i want to uh, touch on is the intellectual both political activism and also the intellectual production of ambedkar why is it that you know ambedkar suddenly after 75 years you know becomes a very important figure not just as a politician but also imaginary like in the context uh, ambedkar in his time and ambedkar in our times as uh, professor rao pointed out ambedkar in his times was the highly educated person of his time like you no know, he has you know phd from columbia and you know law degree from lsc and also you no know, he had sanskrit learning from germany what is it that it is this you no know, education like you no know, gandhi nehru you cannot compare ambedkar with anyone in terms of education that's one of the reasons why he was able to stand out alone and also could fight with gandhi and argue without compromise precisely because of his education because they can refute him on anything but not in his intellectual caliber and another important aspect about gandhi um, ambedkar in his time is that he he was a prolific intellectual like you know despite everyday engagement with politics he was the only po- you know politician intellectual and activist i think you know who wrote nearly 52 books and you know taking from sociology to you know economics religion you know, law you know you touch any subject he was true intellectual and philosopher in the context of his time and also that's what that is what the legacy of ambedkar is why are we running back to his writings precisely because he has reflected on every aspect of indian society from you know uh, problem of rupee to you know law to constitution to uh, all these things what you see is that you no know, it is this multifarious production of ambedkar which is very critical for our time and also for his time so it is in this context what happens is that you know and the, the readings he had you know the philosophical readings of western philosophy and also indian tradition both sanskrit and the buddhist tradition is very very critical so it is this you know uh, wide ranging readings and also reproduction production in terms of intellectual solutions to the problems of society which is very critical in terms of making him relevant not only in his time but also even after 75 years after his death at it is this you no know, intellectuality which is very very important and the final question you know which uh, you know anus paper particularly touched upon the question of caste like you no know, the you no know, elephant in the room basically you know where in which like you know like for long that like, you know indian academia particularly till 19 even till you know very recently what you see is that you know it is this eraser of caste as a fundamental intellectual category which was central to the idea of reproduction of knowledge in india and why is the democracy in india is in crisis precisely because of that the caste hindu privileged you know people you know intellectuals academics from you no know, all religions for that matter hindu muslim and you know christian all the intellectuals who produced and wrote in india is that you know consciously ignored and erased the 
caste as a in analytical category. It, but it was Ambedkar during anti-colonial nationalism, both in the context of writing table conferences and also in the context of writing of Indian constitution, made caste as a national issue. Even at the you no, know, even person like Gandhi could not ignore the caste inequality and untouchability. And that was the power of his writings. But in the context of post-colonial India, one of the important things, like you know, what had happened that you know, the last caste census, like in fact, now there is a debate in India about whether there should be caste census or not. And last caste census were conducted in 1931. The post-colonial Indian nation state refused to conduct caste census because it was not in the like it's it thought that you know it can erase caste and also keep the caste privileges as they were. And in this context, what happens is that you know this Ambedkar's very important intellectual or sociological contribution to Indian society or intellectual you know, aspects of Indian society is this whole idea of making not caste as just political category, but also caste as a sociological category. And I think it is this particularly, you know, other than uh, D.D. Kosambi, you don't see any other intellectual in India who have used caste as an important analytical category and try to, you know, illustrate caste and its sociological and political and, you know, religious implications. So it is in this context, understanding caste in India, you cannot understand caste in India without reading Ambedkar. It is this anti-caste reading of Ambedkar and anti-caste writings of Ambedkar. Ultimately, what happens is that, you know, it, you can understand the Brahmanism and its politics in India. It is like this, you know, if you want to understand capitalism, you need to read Marx, right? Similarly, if you want to understand Brahmanism, you need to read Ambedkar. And it is this, you know, this antithesis, you know, it is the, again, the dialectical relationship between, you know, uh, uh, these two ideologies is very, very central. So therefore, Marxism and capitalism, if you really want to do the connection, Similarly, the Brahmanism and Ambedkarism needs to be seen. So it is this relationship, I think, that is what you know, Anu is trying to point to us. That, you know, why is it that caste is central and why Ambedkar's analysis of caste is very important and also very, you know, original and phenomenal, phenomenal contribution precisely because of this. That, you know, the way in which it delineated the intricate operations of Brahmanism and the caste system both in terms of endogamy and also in terms of purity, pollution, and also how the you know, Vedas and also the you know, various Hindu religious texts are foundational in terms of you know, making, justifying and naturalizing caste system. So it is in this context what happens is that, you know, like then, you know, the colonial state, particularly the British colonial state, what it does is that, you know, by modifying the caste system to suit its needs, what it does is that you know it makes it cost much more effective in terms of surplus extraction and also exploitation and social ordering and political ordering. So therefore, what happens is that you know the indigenous elites were absorbed into the colonial institutions. And unlike that's what like, we live in North America, where we have this indigenous you know, violence, particularly annihilation, and also so much genocide happened against indigenous people. But in India, it did not happen precisely because indigenous el elites were turned into collaborators of the colonialism. That's what the cleverness of Brahmanism, the Brahmanism and colonialism, how they work together. It is this, I think, Pule and Ambedkar, that is what they try to point out to us. The mechanism of caste, how it is you know, skillful, helpful in terms of colonial systems, you know, continuation and also the success. So it is this, I think, which is very critical and Ambedkar's analysis and also his reflections on caste, particularly both in you know, the first essay, which um, you know, Anu, Anupama Rao read very closely, and the second one is the solution in terms of annihilation of caste as a foundation to the building democratic and egalitarian society are very, very critical texts. Like, you know, I, for me personally, annihilation of caste is like an anti-caste Bible. Like, if you really want to have an anti-caste agenda, and I think that is what you have to see that they have to read these two texts. It is one, a theoretical reflection. The second one is a solution to that problem. And it is this you know, interconnection, which is ultimately needs to be seen. And again, you know, uh, how we read religion as a democratic process. And I think this is what I see that the three aspects of Ambedkar, the context, you know, the intellectual production and the uh, illustration and caste system, 
how these three are connected and how ultimately Ambedkar studies today, what we have is that, you know, this is what we try to do. How we made like, you know, for example, people like me, young scholars who are trying to reflect on Dalit politics and caste system in India is that Ambedkar becomes uh, our theoretical, you know, figure and a torch bearer because, you know, we follow his writings and which ultimately helps us navigate you know, in this intellectual challenges. And it is this in this context, I think, uh, what you see is that, you know, is the global reflection. In fact, I wrote a note, what Fra Franz Fanon was for decolonization theory is like, you no. Know, I think this is what we have to bring in Ambedkar equal to Franz Fanon in terms of reclaiming, you know, decolonization and anti-colonialism and also refiguring the, you know, very idea of democratic politics in post-colonial nations. So it is in this context, I think the anti-race politics and anti-indigenous you know, indigenous politics and Dalit politics have this global you know, uh, connections. And, it, and this is where I think the Durban conference on Dalit argument for in, in recognition of caste in on par with race was a very important in 2001, precisely because it is this context of read, you know, interconnecting the global politics of race, caste, and you know, indigeneity and uh, you know, sex is very, very important. And this is what where Ambedkar is very, very crucial as a global intellectual and global figure who was able to see these interconnections and also made these connections. He traveled across and also he was conscious of his position. Like, you know, recently I came across that, you know, when he was drafting the constitution in 19, I think uh, in 1946, I think he visited Canada, for example, to, you know, do a presentation. And you know, the year is a man who was traveling across and trying to present, you know, his work and you know, have a conversation with different, you know, uh, struggles of the people, particularly, you know, people who are vulnerable and who are basically marginalized by the majoritarian systems in the context of white nationalism and white racism in, you know, in North America and in the context of you know Hindu Brahmanism in India. And it is this which ultimately what you see that you no know, today, if you really want to you no, know, have a democratic solution to what is happening in India. Like, you know, why is it that majority, you know, mainstream political parties do not own up to what is happening in terms of against Muslims? Are you know, even today I was reading in Manipur, you know, you know, so much is happening, but you know, no one is going talking about these things. Can we take all that? It's very talk, important. Can we talk all that in the question and answer session? Thank you, thank yeah. you so much, and I think you know. Thank you so much for this, and uh, I really appreciate Thank you. It. <clears throat> Thank, Thank you, all three speakers. <clears throat> now, before we enter into question and session, this is as an announcement always for the coming Saturday um, from Professor, a very famous professor from Aligarh, Professor Zawur Rahman. Uh, he has a lot of degrees, <laughs> now you can see National Academy members of almost everything very famous person in the field of pharmacology. So he is going to talk on the influence of medieval Muslim scholars in the field of medicine. Uh, he is a national figure in India, in, at least in his discipline. And he will be joined by Professor Mirza Atif Beg for introductory remark and Professor Abu Khaldoum al Mahmoud from Dhaka as in the concluding remarks. So over to Dr. Rafat Hussain for moderating the question and answer session. Thank you all three. Okay, Rafat. Thank you, Dr. Raziuddin. And uh, this is uh, the question and answer session. Uh, we open the question and answer session. Before we begin, I would like to thank uh, Professor Rao and Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Jangam. It was a wonderful session. We learned a lot. So let's uh, begin the um question and answer session you can raise your digital hand and of course uh, you can put your, your comment uh, of course i see a lot of comments but your question in chat box so i will monitor both of them so let's see if there is razibai do you see because my screen is changed so i am wondering if uh, there is any digital hand uh, not yet. No, we are not able to not able to raise the digital hand. Some settings That's... issue, but yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Who, who is that? Uh, please go ahead. Identify yourself. Yeah, go ahead. 
there is a hand raised. So there is. So, yeah, I have a question. Okay. Okay. So you I'm unmute right. me. My right. name is uh, Roy Mantina. I'm uh, based out of this Boston area, and I posted my comment or question there, but I'm looking for these experts, these professors to answer. You know, this um, Intellectuals Academia is very successful in, in these decades, uh, taking this Ambedkar legacy, his teachings, his writings, his philosophy, his ideology uh, to, the, to the masses, to Democrats, to left, to, to progressives, what it takes to, you know, take the same message to this right wing in, 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 you know, basically they're doing what they're doing because lack of ignorance, lack of understanding about Ambedkar. So my question to Academia, what it takes to take this education to this right who is deaf, who is dumb about Ambedkar? Good question. Uh, who wants to take it? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I can take a stab at it, but I think uh, both uh, Chinaya and, and uh, Ayaz will also have some things to say. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, this is this is a kind of fundamental contradiction. We could certainly try to take Ambedkar's thought uh, to the right. It also seems to me that they have successfully appropriated elements of Ambedkar's thought too. It's not clear to me that the right has been unwilling. In fact, I think they've been very good about seizing on particular ways in which they might, um, you know, both engage Ambedkar and uh, ignore the radical, you know, the radical insurgent elements of Ambedkar's thought. And so one question that I would have is, you know, what, what would be the reason <laughs> for offering up Ambedkar to, to, to the right? This seems to be politically um, a dangerous uh, kind of a move on our part. It would appear to me that, you know, we should be using Ambedkar and other um, radicals as an elaborate tradition, progressive thought, radical and insurgent thinking coming from feminist and anti-caste. And as I think uh, Chinaya was saying, you know, other perspectives. And what we really have is a much, much more capacious imagination of equality, one that is truly, uh, you know, uh, thinking through the question of anti-caste and annihilatory, you know, annihilating caste. Whereas it seems to me that the Hindutva project is at best has been extremely sophisticated in remobilizing, reproducing, and remaking both caste distinction while using it in the interest of something like a broader corporate Hindu identity, one that's actually reproduced, that fundamental cleavage that Ambedkar, for instance, talks about, which is the touchable, untouchable, and increasingly also uh, within Dalit communities and castes, there's a kind of churn that's happening around their relationship to Hindutva. So I'm not sure what kind of Ambedkar we want to offer up. My colleagues may have a very different viewpoint on this. Go ahead, please. Anyone of you? Ayaj, you want to go? Or should I? Please go ahead. I will have one short comment, but please go ahead. Yes, should I go? Yeah, please. Just, um, please go. Yes. No, yeah, I think this is a very, uh, uh, you know, very provocative, rather, yes. uh, the idea of, you know, giving Ambedkar to, and uh, it's like, you know, the, this is like, uh, uh, I think, you know, th there is a fundamental misunderstanding about the Ambedkar politics and what is happening in Hindutva context. We are under this uh, misconception that, you know, Hindutva has, you know, co-opted Ambedkarism because, you know, no one, especially Hindutva can never you know, co-opt Ambedkar. What um, Hindutva is co-opting, the so-called, you know, Ambedkarites, you know, who are pragmatic, you know, uh, Ramda Satewale are, you know, all these political figures who are supposed to be earlier Ambedkarites are now active in BJP politics. And these are all, again, you know, uh, at one level you have to separate the ideology and the pragmatic politics of the people, basically. And uh, it, it is this which is very important. And most importantly, any serious reading of Ambedkar can never become part of Hindutva agenda because it's a, Ambedkar is an antithesis of RSS and Hindutva. So, and it is this, I think, uh, we should not think that, you know, Ambedkar has been co-opted by Hindutva because, you know, that is a, you know, gross injustice to very Ambedkarism itself. Because the, they they can never go together. 
I can understand if it is like, you know, Rahul Gandhi holding constitution and talking about Ambedkar. At least, you know, there is a dialogue. There is a, you know, there is a possibility of sitting and, you know, but uh, I don't think RSS will ever read annihilation of caste and think that, you know, they can spread RSS ideology in India. Because that's what, like, you know, yeah, I think recently there are there are very interesting works are coming. The former RSS Dalit activists who who came out of RSS and you know trying to tell how casteism existed within RSS because the fundamental aspect of RSS is Brahmanism. Brahmanism doesn't believe I'm in. Sorry to interlude. Yeah. I just want to um, tell you all three. You have to be very brief, otherwise, so many questions. Yeah. You will feel tired, and you want to you know you will want to go, get out from this. So thank you. Thank you, Razi Bhai, for interjecting. I was thinking be very that... brief because so many people have written. And... Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, Imtia Saab. Um, Ayaz Saab, I will come back to you. Okay, go ahead and say a few words if you want to before. Yeah, I, I just wanted to briefly comment on the question that the assumption that somehow Hindutva is ignorant of a right thought, I think, and that the question assumed this uh, possibility, and therefore, uh, I think Hindutva and proponents of Hindutva, right from 1920s, they were very, very seriously reading the Ambedkar. They are very widely read, uh, analyzed, and they are and inverted. So, therefore, it's not a question of fighting the Hindutva force, which is ignorant or uneducated. They are very educated, very aware, very qualified. It's a matter of different worldviews that we are contesting. One is through Ambedkar right worldview, and another is our right world. So, uh, yeah, that's the short point that I wanted to make on that question. Thank you. Mtsa. Okay. Thank you, Professor Rao and others for a very intellectual and informative presentation. My question is very elementary. <laughs> How did caste begin in India? And what is this brief history? And is it only in India that it developed or in any other country or society, you also <coughs> see caste distinctions in the society. Um, Tia Saab, you ask a big, big question. So let's see if uh, anyone can give a tap, quick tap. <coughs> um, there are caste-like formations, I think, around the world. And that's part of the project of thinking about caste as a kind of ur or a, or a conceptual signifier for thinking about other forms of separation uh, within the social. So I think to the extent that you know we want to think about caste in kind of broad sense, we could say there are caste-like formations if we think about this as a kind of leaving of the social within itself and so on. I think the question of the history of caste is both long and contested, and it depends on which set of you know ancient uh, South, you know India scholars, scholars of the subcontinent you want to think about. But many have made the argument. People like Romila Thapar, more uh, recently, I think Manu Devadevan has got a quite brilliant argument about medieval and early modern kind of you know caste uh, the, the emergence and history of the caste and so on. And there, there are many arguments about the relationship between caste and the state, caste and the control over territory, caste itself and its relationship to the control over surplus, caste and kingship and so on. And so I think you could have a textual and a kind of indological reading about the origin as it were of caste, you know, Fiction, origin is always a fiction, right? It's a, always a kind of good starting point. I can start in 1903. I can start in, you know, 1875. So the origin question, I think, is, is hard with. But I think it becomes quite hard to do that. And I'm not an ancient um, India scholar in that sense to give you the entire panoply of things, but I'm happy to also continue to talk with you and suggest other things as well in terms of reading. Thank you, Professor. Let's move on. Another question is from Venkat Reddy on the chat box. How do you understand and respond day to day battles of Dalit for education and livelihood, which are not in their access? So it's a trivial question, but if anyone wants to take it. I don't think it's trivial at all. Um, Jina, would you like to start? I think you can go ahead. 
No, I think it's not a trivial question at all. And I think it comes back to some of the things that all three of us were talking about, that there is a place for critical reflection and a kind of critical engagement using a set of systematic mm -hmm. tools for doing uh, intellectual history, for thinking about political concepts, right? Their function, the ways in which they're used, um, abused, and so forth. But I think there's also that very real question that Ambedkar also means something else to others. And I'm assuming that that's the kind of question that you're asking. And that here we have a very profound question of dispossession, marginalization, the continued ways in which caste cleaves, right? The political economy of uh, the subcontinent and of India in particular. So I don't think that this is a, this is a, uh, uh, this is a very serious question. I, I would not know where really to begin except to start thinking through the range of both policy measures, one could say kind of, you know, affirmative action measures, they exist more rhetorically than in reality and in practice, but those things are extremely significant. So I think legal interventions are deeply significant. I think the ways in which one might want to think about and intervene in the ways in which we are experiencing what in India now is jobless growth and has been happening for many decades and the kind of agrarian crisis and the overall crisis of political economy, what can Ambedkar bring to this as a political economist? These are all really profound questions. I don't have a one point response for you at all. Um, I think the biggest thing also that I would just want to add, because all of us are teachers and um, we we work in the classroom, that's, that's our place where we engage in social transformation, <laughs> the really critical debates about what we read, how we learn, and how we think about the project of democratic education within and without the university is very profound. And I would want to put my neck on the line there because this is in a sense what I do and know how to do and I hope you'll um, you know thank you for that question. Thank you so much professor. A quick question from Dr. Sandhya Vipla from Hyderabad. She is asking may I know about the universities that are offering studies of Ambedkar ideology? Do you, anyone of who you know the universities either abroad or in India offering the study on Ambedkar ideology? I think there are many, many institutions in, in India that are offering, uh, there are departments of Ambedkar I taught, for instance, in Nagpur. There are departments of, um, I think, social exclusion and so forth, where there is a real commitment to thinking and reading Ambedkar quite widely. Uh, it seems to me more and more that most of our elite institutions are taking up readings of Ambedkar, including my own. The core curriculum at Columbia, which is over a century century old now, uh, now has a, a reading of Annihilation of Caste as a prescribed text. And this goes to um, Chinaya's wonderful point about putting Ambedkar in conversation with someone like Fanon and others. And that happens in that course and Du Bois and so forth. So I think uh, Ambedkar is, is kind of at large now. And the question really might be what kind of Ambedkar and what readings of Ambedkar do we really want to invest in? But I please, um, Ayaz and Chinay, I think this is a question for both of you too. Okay. Ayaz, you should go. I, I spoke already. Okay, great. Thank you. So another question is uh, from Dr. Devanand. Why is not Ambedkar's writing on Islam not popularized? Thank you, yeah. sir. Thank yeah, you for yeah. thank you for uh, asking this yeah. question. Uh, this, in fact, uh, is a very profound, very serious, a uh, kind of uh, um, uh, um, unneglectable question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Diego, Professor. Ram? I I think Ayaz wanted to to jump in, so please, Ayaz. Yes. I yep. think this question, previous questions about, and also because you presented, uh, Razi, reflected on the cast. Can you please uh, put on? I, mute? I think, oh, I think this this is a very important uh, point. 
please identify both for the please identify this is a very important point am i as ahmed doctor as ahmed i'm i'm responding to the question please go ahead uh, why why medical writing on islam are not being popularized yeah i am connecting this question with the with the question of uh, original caste uh yeah so uh professor so as you also reflected on the origin of caste you see uh, and the origin of caste by baba saheb himself uh, it is mostly within the brahmanical uh, historiography and uh, culture law uh, social and political life however if we look at the story of caste especially from the 11th century onwards in the context of islam when we have with us today uh, something like fatwa e jahadari by jawdin barni and uh, Akbar's department of uh, Nakabat, where caste was to be identified before anyone could be brought into the Mughal administration. The the Ambedkar's writing on is on, on Muslims, Islam uh, especially, uh, whereby he at some places points out the graded inequality and caste practices within Muslims, uh, and they are very exclusionary, very elitist overtones. I think that complicates the. origin story as well as sustenance story of caste so then therefore it forces us to think the deliberate silence of ambedkar's writing on many muslim and islamic practices within the indian subcontinent somehow uh, shows the limitation of the theory of sustenance of caste because then we have to look at caste not only as hindu phenomena but as something which is jointly produced by all theological apparatuses be it islam christianity sikhism and so on and so forth and therefore the origin story as well as sustenance story gets complicated i think my intuition is that the silence on ambedkar's writing on muslims especially pakistan or partition of india whether it is it is gandhi jinn or rana day or the communal deadlock and the way to solve it i think the silencing of pasmanda discourse also to a great extent in the origin and sustenance of caste therefore uh is basically a, an attempt to keep caste as exclusively hindu phenomena and then uh marginalize the pasmanda discourse as well as uh in a way give a escape route to brahmanical hindutva at a time when a joint effort against brahmanical hindutva is needed whereby subaltern across religious categories Uh, subaltern caste across religious categories can come together and launch a decisive resistance against hindutva power i think that is that is my intuition uh, in response to the question and as well as your presentation that i think that is why uh, people are reluctant to take up ambedkar's writing i think on uh, islam and muslims and mostly it is the right wing hindutva which is taking up and that is actually giving up the task completely uh, which is very suicidal i think in my view thank you dr thank you, sir thank you for uh, evading this question anyway you did attempt to uh, you know uh, answer this question thank you okay let's move forward uh from ravi strict uh, time timeline here that's why <laughs> yeah please there are a couple more question thank you so much for your patience and there is a question from ravi kumar why did ambedkar fail in winning elections multiple times even though he had mass following um i think uh, the the puna pact and his reflections in 1945 what congress and gandhi have done to the untouchables and it's a very important text where he actually evaluates the um the success which is to say the failure as it were of a reserved system of election one that does not actually allow for the full and true representation of scheduled caste candidates to come to the fore and to make the interest of the scheduled caste community actually viable and relevant politically right as a as a force that this is a very important text for i think understanding what we might call the tyranny of the majority and if you look not just at what congress and gandhi have done to the untouchables but you know raja ji writes a text at that time there is somebody called k santanam who writes at that time and there is a way in which what we have in that critical period between 1942 and 1946 is uh, indeed the reinstitution 
or the reclamation of the Congress itself as standing in for, uh, uh, you know, the general electorate, so to speak, right? And you do have a very serious conversation uh, where the tyranny of the majority continues to be um, kind of restated in many different ways. And I think Ambedkar's 1945 text is both a response to what has happened on the ground, precisely your question, why does he not win elections uh, as much as perhaps he ought to have, right? 37 is important and so forth, 52 becomes important in Bombay and so on. Uh, but I think there's also the broader ways in which democratic politics itself obfuscates the substantive demand for rights by creating a situation of formal equality at best. Okay, thank you so much. My humble request, please be brief. There are so many questions lined up. Your talk was so interesting, <laughs> looks like. So, Sayyad Amir Saab. Thank you. I want to thank all three scholars. Um, to most of us, um, Professor Ambedkar is known as constitutional scholar and architect of India's constitution. Um, to what extent do you think uh, India's constitution reflects his personality and his views? Um, if he indeed must have influenced it. Um, the second question is primarily for Professor Rao this in Columbia University, which is al his alma mater. In any way, does it celebrate um, or commemorate his presence uh, during his time, I mean, the Columbia University. Oh. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, the Constitution is, 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 I think, a collective document. It bears the imprint of some of his main ideas and commitments, it seems to me, to a kind of radical imagination of social equality. But, you know, there's a number of really wonderful new work that's coming out and has come out that really speaks to how we might begin to think about the relationship between the Constitution as this kind of collective document and the kind of very particular genealogies of um, important um, members of the constituent uh, assembly. So I think I would have to say yes and no, since we're being asked for very quick responses. The second one, how does uh, Columbia celebrate this? Um, there is an annual celebration in the library where there's a bust of Ambedkar, where uh, there is a commemoration of Ambedkar and his relationship to the university. The Ambedkar Initiative is an effort to try to do this and to spread this uh, in a number of ways across the institution. Um, you know, and the university will occasionally uh, claim claim him as a as a native son. Much, of course, much, much, much more could be done. Uh, much more could be done. Thank you so much. Uh, Priya Darshan, recent judgment of Supreme Court about classification of a scheduled caste. Is it a fragmentation and or RSS agenda? I can respond to that. <laughs> yeah, go ahead quickly. <laughs> I think, you know, that is a recent judgment and uh, uh, because I come from Telugu states, so I'm from Telangana and in fact, uh, the origin of the story goes back to uh, what has, what was happening in Telugu states for the last 30 years uh, in terms of Mala Madhya conflict and uh, all this. Uh, but you know, one thing is that you know, the subclassification uh, has done a lot of damage uh, in terms of the whole uh, you know, uh, this fabric of Dalit uh, politics in Tel Telugu states, like in terms of you know, how there is a vertical divide. But I think subclassification is also an interesting reflection on the larger aspect of caste, reproduction of caste within Dalit communities. There is a Brahmanism which gets practiced among Dalits. There is an untouchability among Dalits. There are no intercaste marriages between different subcastes among Dalits. And uh, there is a graded inequality. And also there are uh, invisualization of many of these you know, small communities. So the, the, the caste you know, is not just a between Brahmins and others and Dalits versus non-Dalits, but within Dalits, there is a problem of caste system and the, you know, the hierarchy and untouchability. So it is in this context, I think, you know, this, this, uh, there is a genuine reason why this has happened. It didn't come out of you know, nowhere. 
and particularly from Telugu states context, I can say, you know, till uh, recently, like you know, the subcaste con uh, movement was basically using Ambedkar as a very important icon. The so-called, uh, you know, aspect of, you know, uh, uh, the Madhya MRPS joining BJP and RSS forces was a recent phenomenon. And if you look at the history of you know, subclassification movement, particularly from different communities, it was not you know, an RSS agenda to begin with. And the RSS agent uh, co-ops, like, you know, that's what, like what they did with in, in other places, like in UP and other places, they always pit one Dalit community against the other. They're trying to use, like that's what they, uh, they, they exploit it. But actually the subclassification has a much more genuine social reasons and also historical reasons why the issue has come. Thank, uh, you. Thank you so much. Um, quick question, Shubham saying, is it possible to completely eradicate the caste system in India? This is the struggle we're all embarked on. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, IT Hub 9 by the name in who raised a hand. Please go ahead. Let me ask you to ask to unmute. I did. Please go ahead. Okay, let's uh, move on to. Um, Shant Akunuri. Uh, that hand is raised. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back to. Uh, next one is Shrikan Chopra. Do you think what if any progress has been made since 1947 to control the Brahmanical majoritarian influence in Indian polity and society and what needs to be done in future? Um, we are all, I think, amongst us historians, and so it would be very difficult for any of us to say that things have remained the same. I think, of course, there's been a lot of transformation. I think the constitutional order is, uh, in many ways, um, a progressive, maybe even a radical order in its imagination. And so I think, you know, what I would say is that the conditions and the contradictions around caste and caste relations keep changing. Uh, better or worse, I think, is something that I would find myself hard-placed to respond to just as a yes or no question. But have things changed? Yes. Is there a greater visibility around some of the demands and the discussions around caste and caste inequality and the very pernicious forms of prejudice and humiliation that actually operate and that go without saying that are being recognized? Is there an emergent Dalit sphere? Is there insurgent mobilization? Yes. But I think also, as uh, Professor Chinaya noted, we are also in the midst of a very, very um, strong sort of counter-revolution, a revanchism that is attacking all of those gains. And so there's always a kind of, you know, effort to both um, think about the, the terms of struggle, but also to think about who the agons, who the targets are. Um, I'd love to hear from both of my colleagues what they think. Yes, uh, yeah, the, the uh, like you know, uh, changes can you know, it is as uh, Professor Rao has pointed out, change of course, uh, you know, was there, and you know, one of the reasons why I'm sitting and talking to you here because of that change reservation system, otherwise, we would not have studied, right? That's what Ambedkar's success is like, you know, like people like uh, me could come and you know, study and teach and become what we are today, and uh. So in that context, you know, uh, like uh, the way in which we see, like, you know, uh, uh, institutional uh, at one level, this is where, you know, the uh, process of democracy and the challenge to inequality and the way in which opportunities are distributed. I think this is where the articulation of Dalit voice and Dalit power lies in using Ambedkar as a very, you know, and his ideology as a way to you know, bargain with the state and bargain with the institutions. And uh, it, it's a long battle, right? You know, because look at caste system, you know, how long, you know, how many years it is. And the battle is very, very long drawn. And Thank I think this is what we are all trying to do. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And remember that we have only 15 minutes left. 
Next one is uh, Avinash. Uh, Professor Rao, this is for, what is your take on caste and race? Can they be seen together? It's in the discourse of 2001 conference. Also, what is your take on recent subcategorization debate? Um, I, I think uh, Professor Chinaya has, has very nicely responded to the sub subclassification debate. I think, as I said also, um, I think when I spoke, caste and race have always had an affinity with each other. They resemble each other as forms of deep inheritable hierarchy, right? They're also based on controls and regulation of the body, right? And they're based on a, a kind of sensual and a sensible uh, order, which is actually about people who are not just face to face, but are cheek by jowl with each other. So it poses very, very important questions about everyday life, about ethical practice and so on. And so in that sense, I think they can be analogous. Uh, their history, of course, is analogous, right? The terms Kasta and Raza are terms of art for the Iberian empires and for the Luciferian world in particular. They are born at the same time because they're seen as forms of social distinction, control over lineage, and so on and so forth. And so I think there's lots of analogies. There are lots of connections. I don't think they're comparable to each other, right? So when you think about, you know, caste and race, or you say, what's the comparison? It's as much about differences and distinctions as about similarity. And I think they also, we also need to think about scales of analysis, right? There are sociological ways in which caste and race were seen together. But there are also ways politically in terms of affinity, solidarity, and broader social movements across the 20th and the 21st centuries, where there have been real efforts to create a kind of caste race unity. So yes, I think they can be seen together. Yeah, question to the panel. Should there be reservation for Muslim? You, you don't have question. to, you have to raise hand. If I Right, you cannot just barge in, please. Can you please mute? I could not raise the hand actually. I, I could not see yeah, but, the sign but, for raising hand. But, but you can write, please don't barge in. Yeah. I will, I will, I will, I will take a note of this thing Thank for you. the next time. Thank you. Okay, next person is uh, Samsung. Oh, uh, Dr. Ahmad, do you want yes. to? Yes, yes. That question reservation for Muslim, that is, uh, I think that is a very, uh, at one level, ignorant, as at, at another level, is a very hegemonic uh, kind of a question, uh, which which keeps getting in anti caste uh, discourse. Muslim uh, reservation, as far as it is concerned, we already have uh, Adivasi, Pasmanda Muslim reservation in scheduled tribe category. We have uh, Ajla, the OBC, Pasmanda uh, Muslim reservation in OBC category. We have uh, 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 upper caste Ashraf, Ashraf Sayyid Ashraf reservation in the EWS category. So every single category, I, almost every single Muslim today is covered by one or the other, you know, category of reservation. Therefore, uh, this is only an attempt to keep the social and political debate only on the question of Muslim, Hindu, Hindu Muslim, and suppress the question of Pasmanda as a subaltern caste uh, group. And also, uh, this is also an attempt to subvert uh, the joint. Dalit Pishati Pisha Adivasi Pasmanda effort to reconstitute the republic on the ideals of the constitution. So uh, that is my short response to the question whether there should be Muslim reservation. There is already a single Muslim is covered under one or the other category of reservation. Thank you. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. The question is uh, from uh, someone by the name Samsung. Today, when we talk about Ambedkar, Ambedkar is confined only to intellectual and universities. When it will happen that we will be able to bring Ambedkar from among intellectuals and universities to the society. Today, what we know that is Ambedkar stands only for constitution. I would say, I I think, would say that please, uh, Arya, I, please. I think you should go to Hyderabad on April 14th. You will understand where <laughs> Yes. Yeah? I was going to say that Ambedkar was a people's Ambedkar 
first before he entered the university. And it's the very, very long tradition of the ways in which Ambedkar was celebrated, commemorated, his thought engaged with, the number of people who created their own archives at incredible cost and labor to themselves because there were no state repositories that wanted the kinds of things that they held as archives, uh, archival documents and things. It is that history that we're standing on the shoulders of. And that's the history of Ambedkar from his time to our time, which is a continuous history of celebrating and commemorating him. Uh, the entrance into the university is extremely recent. Thank you. Um, sorry, my apologies to Dr. Devanand. I am not taking a second question from the same person. If time permits, uh, we will come back. Uh, the Prashant uh, Akunuri raised the hand. Now he has put the comment. African American seems to have penetrated into many leadership position across USA. Why similarly people from marginalized communities are unable to do it in India since 1950s? Um, I, a, I don't know that this is true. There's a very deep conversation about the black bourgeoisie and the underclass. This has been part of a longstanding speaking of sociology, a set of debates about the nature of um, race, racial capitalism and poverty in the United States. And I think similarly in India, we've seen some interesting conversations about Dalit capitalism, um, people making an argument that this becomes a way to kind of evade, as it were, state strictures and so forth and move into the market. So the state versus market it, uh, which gets get, keeps getting replayed, I think is again, I'm going to adopt what Ayaz was saying, it's a very pernicious and a kind of false uh, uh, binary that gets uh, reproduced because then what we end up also having are various forms of tokenism that get celebrated rather than a deeper structural transformation and a change. You know, and in India, this is extremely important. I mean, many people have brought up the question of reservation and subclassification. Well, you know, the state itself is is a you know is is unable to provide jobs. You know, the state in India has been the largest employer, and so this relationship between private capital and the public functions of the state and what's happening in the context of what has come to be called neoliberalism, I think, is something that we think should be thinking about very deeply. Otherwise, we end up in, in a kind of tokenistic, it seems to me, set of, you know, arguments. Wow, you know, I did it. Why not you? I worked hard. So are you not working hard? You know, it reproduces all of the kind of racial and casted categories of uh, acquisitive individualism, if I can use that term. Okay, thank you. There was a question from Nidhi. In what context? I don't. Uh, what about SC? Schedule cast. That's the only question. I don't know what context she was asking. But uh, if you have a comment on that, otherwise we move on. Another is yeah, thank you. But my uh, answer, my question is already answered. <laughs> so thank you. Okay, thank you, Nidhi. Um, the next is uh, by the name One Plus. How do you how to understand leftist appropriation of Ambedkar's statement? Caste is an enclosed class to reduce caste to caste, uh, caste to class and vice versa. Um, please go ahead. No, no, I ask, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I, on that question about the understanding of class, I think uh, it is because the Indian left, which happened to be Brahmin Savarna and a few Sayyid Ashraf here and there, because it was so caste blind, uh, that it could not see what Dr. Mekar was trying to say, that caste is an enclosed class, which means that all the class markers, practices, they are already included within the caste structure, right? And therefore, their attempt to say that, well, there is the erasure of class, I think that is, uh, again, a false binary. The Marxist thinking itself has evolved, as I said in my introductory remarks, has evolved over a period of time to converge behind the materialism. Now we do not have classical Marxism and post-Marxism whereby economic relationships are not central to the production of con uh, collective identities. But that is, the, that is something which Ambedkar was talking, writing in 1916. So it is basically the failure of the Indian upper caste, Brahminical, Savarna, Shraf left rather than 
in any way any limitation of uh, Dr. Ambedkar. He was much ahead of his time, and that kind of a reflection is needed. That's why Ambedkar studies, centrality of Ambedkar studies from variety of perspectives. Over okay. to you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, please, ref uh, the question from Vinod Arya. Please reflect upon how to end up with a atrocious caste system. This is the similar question asked earlier. Um, go ahead in a quick sentence. Uh, th there are a range of strategies and tools. Uh, I think it has to do with unlearning our privilege for those of us who have privilege, who are uh, beneficiaries of uh, this in, you know, system of inherited hierarchy, which is about the access to caste itself as a form of capital. So I think it depends on what end you want to look at this from. So there's a deep process of unlearning. There is a deep process of creating solidarity. I think there's a deep process of creating space for those who represent their communities uh, without necessarily giving way to identitarianism. And so I think there's a space of deep respect, but also that you know it is time for those who have been the beneficiaries of a social order that has been sustained for so long that it is time for them to actually learn from others. And I think this is the most important thing that we can do in terms of bringing about deep change, that listening opens our ears to other ways of thinking, other ways of thinking about respect, aspects of other forms of life that we do not believe uh, you know, should be in our midst, how do we actually engage with others? How do we think about the real question of social intercourse? I mean, this is, again, to go back to what I think Ayaz was saying, that 1916 text, if caste is an asocial order, it's an anti-social order, how do we really think about being together? And this is very, very fundamental, it seems to me. And I say this as an upper caste person with all of the history and baggage that, you know, comes with both my name and my history. So I speak from that position. Thank you so much for your patience. Last two questions. Why we say Brahmins are uh, Mediterranean, even though even they are in the minority, and we embed Christ, so which includes uh, Dalit, Adivasis, Muslim, BCs, and even many sects of higher caste group are majority. This question is from Zakaria Vaida. Mehmeen, why the Brahmins are called, are counted as majoritarian, even though they are in minority? Janaya, you want to take this <laughs> one? <laughs> you haven't spoken. <laughs> no, they are, they are not. In, it's it's Brahmanism as an ideology. And it's an ideological thing which actually produces and reproduces this idea of majoritarian communities. It is not about numbers. It's about the magic of creating this magical number of majority. Very well said. Thank you, Jangna. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> uh, the last question from Natta Kumar, and my apologies if I missed anyone because we are running out of time. What are your thoughts on subcategorization without a formal caste census? Grouping multiple castes into A, B, C, D groups also has the same effect of the caste within a group. Consuming all resources allocated to that group, what are your thoughts on that issue? Again, you know, I think that this is where, you know, uh, my, uh, I think this is what, uh, like, the debate about caste census is, uh, you know, uh, very serious in India now. And I think uh, this is what, uh, like, the progressive forces in India is asking for. I think we need to have caste census not only among Dalits, but across the country and across the communities and religions. And that needs to be a very important thing. It's not just about reservation, but also any other policy interventions. It's very important. Without data, you cannot intervene. And, and, and we should think about something else. This was something that Gail Omvit had suggested a long time ago. Rather than thinking about subclassification amongst those who are, quote unquote, the beneficiaries of reservation, the caste census actually allows us to precisely come back and think through the ways in which a minority, a demographic minority, has exercised ideological hegemony, right, over um, state and society. And mm -hmm. I think the caste census would also allow us to see that.
And if the question is about representation and proportion, we should be also thinking about, uh, you know, an internal fissure of, of uh, upper castes uh, and those communities too, right? So there's something very odd that happens in the way that all of this gets played out only on the other side of the reservations debate, rather than I think as Chennai is saying, the caste census actually allows us to see society enumerated in a sense represented to us, visibilized and externalized so that we really can begin to get a sense of what this debate is about substantive equality, about rights, about entitlement, and most importantly, resources. If you allow me, can I put one more question? He's a, he's a regular from Abdul Jabbar. Please go ahead and yeah. quickly ask. Yeah, him. I think it's, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, uh, intellectual stimulated discussion. I'm just... Uh, thrilled about, uh, but I, I have a two-part uh, kind of uh, clarification. I grew up in Tamil Nadu uh, in this 1950s. During that time, uh, only Nehru, Gandhi were the dominant figures in terms of uh, the political, also the uh, national conscience. Um, Ambedkar was not even mm -hmm. mentioned. I never, I never heard of Ambedkar while growing up. I think there's a deficit. Uh, probably you, are, you talked about it. There is a concerted effort by the Congress party to sideline um, and both cut it the, on the, not, on the uh, I don't know, it's a, uh, uh, the, I don't know what, what happened. Why the, the, con, the, the constitution, frame of the constitution was such, treated such, such a way the students like us, children, were not taught. That is the first point. The, the, because history has to be taught at the very young age, like they do in this country, in this in, in the US. But that's one, one part. I think the people have uh, taught, uh, kind of touched on that in other questions. The other part I have, uh, Ambedkar really talked, thought about the Hinduism, casteism for 20 years, but but the, when he made the decision to switch to Buddhism, it took him 20, more than 20 years to make the decision. Uh, well, that means he was very ambivalent about his own position. Uh, why he took that long? I think it looks like only about a few months before he passed on, uh, he became a Buddhist. Sure. So this is a very, uh, uh, very uh, you know, this is a very late hour, so one. So I just wanted to make uh, those comments. If, you, if you. you have an in, insight, you can just briefly talk about it. Otherwise, I think uh, it's a wonderful uh, intellectual estimate discussion. Thank you for Thank that. Thank you so much. And uh, if I missed any question, my sincere apologies. And we are, although Thank I covered all of them. There's and, one question from me, so I can end up. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's <laughs> always the case. So now I pass on to Dr. Razi Raziuddin, and uh, I need to take a leave. So thank you so much. Thank Go you. ahead. Thank you so much. So my could I, could I co quickly comment on that uh, comment? Just a very short. Uh, Razi. Yeah, yeah. Please. Very short. Mm -hmm. Why is that Ambedkar was not taught to us when we were, uh, you know, in school or college? The same reason why Abdul Qayyum Ansari is not being taught sufficiently to us. The hegemonic forces always try to suppress the counter-hegemonic ideas, thoughts, thinkers, and that is the same reason why we do not have enough of Abdul Qayyum Ansari today, or for that matter, uh, Maulana Asim Bihari for that matter. So yeah, that, that's my short comment on that question or comment. Okay, back, back to Dr. Razi Raziuddin. So the question is, what in the present time, Rahul Gandhi is spearheading? I mean, this is a question that if we have a caste census uh, inclu that includes all castes, even including minorities and Muslims. So by that, he counts 90% almost will be those who are non-Brahmins. So would that be the best thing that once you know the percentage and the equitable share 
goes to them and that will be the only radical or the most radical way to have a classless or a utopian India? Who will block that? Who will block that if suppose the Dalit plus Muslim plus OBC become really conscious or con yeah, conscious about their percentage and they raise this bogey that no, we must have the census. So the rest 15%, how can they block or resist such a powerful movement? And is that a tipping point now? Are we Jangam Saab or Rao or any? I mean, I mean, is this really where where Rahul is turning into another imaginative Gandhi or somebody else? No, it, I think it's much more, uh, you know, uh, uh, no, it's not just about, uh, I think, you know, it's what is important is that, you know, I think uh, the democracy itself is at tipping point now. Like, you no, know, like uh, post-independent India, we never had caste-based census. And uh, most importantly, Indian elites, particularly caste in the elites, are very unethical people. Like, you no, know, they are not you know, ethical in terms of their own caste, inherited caste privileges. They you know, like look at Indian media. You no, know, do you see any you no know, Dalit or any you know oppressed person sitting in any media house and talking about issues? There's so many times they talk about Muslims, Dalits, all Brahmins are sitting and talking about Muslims and Dalits. Can you imagine a, a debate in America about blacks and whites talking about it majority without a black person sitting there? So it is. I think this is what uh, no Rahul is hinting at. Like no, look at Indian cricket team. Look at you know, think about anything so-called iconic things in India. They have no accountability. Yes, of course, that was the past. That's what we are saying. That in the past or even in the current we have no representation and yeah. the only way forward is to have this and do the equitable share of each which is what is needed but that really that is a going to happen who no, will block it that no, is the... it, will, it will never happen like at the end of the day congress is a you know ma no mainstream political party oh, the no, no, we are no, facing no, 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 I, I, I have now a change of heart. This Congress, now <laughs> led by this person, has yeah. singularly transformed or trying to transform an image to counter the narrative of Hindutva. There is no doubt about it. He is doing, and this is not the same Congress we can accuse even 10 years back, because it is... It is a total, have you ever heard even Nehru saying so loudly about RSS, saying so loudly about caste? This guy is saying openly on the street, sitting on the street, talking about with Dalits, and that's why the Samajwadis have come together. As Samajwadi party will never go to Congress and sit together in a farm and alliance. Unless this transformation too. No, I I of course I we all admire what Rahul Gandhi is doing. That is there is no doubt. Like you know, there is a promise in it, and uh, particularly the rhetoric and the pos postering is doing. We we appreciate it, and he's one of those persons fighting courageously, and uh, that is there. But thing is that we, redistribution really will happen up after. Yeah. <laughs> well, that is the question. But that never happens anywhere, anyway. Any, that's why, but but it's a, one of the ways to go forward. Yeah, like, this is the way. One to of go. the ways to go forward. Like you cannot hide the you no know, rotten system forever, and we yeah. need to clean that system. We have to be practical. Also, it never happens anywhere. It even didn't happen in Soviet Union. You no, know, they the upper class lived in Kremlin, and the rest were all dying elsewhere. So with this note. And thank you so much. It was really wonderful. Wonderful. Thank talk. you, Jai Beam, to you all for your Jai time. Beam. I really wanted I to thank my colleagues for 
all of their comments and engagement. And I always learn from them both. And I'm thrilled that they both agreed to be part of this. So thank you, heartfelt. Uh, to thank you. Uh, somebody proposed that this is such a nice talk and so engaging. It should be translated into Telugu. I know somebody who... <laughs> So we won a translation English. award right here, so to, right here with us. Yeah, <laughs> but maybe in all languages. This, but this is some... not what you should be translating. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, then it can, I mean, maybe it can spread further. More, you know, more people can learn. But thank you all. Razi bhai, I have yeah. a question, not for now, but you said that this is RSS ideology, casteism. Is it true? What? That people, those who are not RSS leaning person, they also believe in casteism. Yes. Yeah, of course. But everybody, even you uh, who. You are infected by caste, to use a basic <laughs> phrase. Even, <laughs> you, even, even I when, believe. Eh? When the person who has asked this, is Sayyid, you know, the upper, upper, upper caste yes. in Muslim hierarchy. And he says he doesn't believe. I, I, I dropped Sayyid, you know that. <laughs> and he is very good friend, obviously, <laughs> very close, and I believe him. I do not know whether in deep in his heart he really is casteless. I don't know. No, problem. and caste is not about surname, it is about power. <laughs> Yes. That's the intuitive response of a caste. Drop the surname. <laughs> but then it is not about surname. It is about the power over material well, this resources. Is, why don't we ever talk about Muslim rule? They very conveniently aligned with the upper caste Hindus and rule India as such. They were very powerful and they could have done a lot of things to modify this. You, you have before you two... Two more talks and two more speakers is what I might suggest. <laughs> I, will, I will challenge you take the Muslim part. They were also accomplished with the same guys. For one and almost 800 years, they were having the upper hand with their might and all those. Why did not? They were practicing Islam themselves. And they knew this thing is not good. But they never pressurized or pushed the upper caste alliance with them to do something to change this thing. So Muslims are as guilty as the Hindus in this business. Oh, thank you. That is such a powerful observation. It is. It is. <laughs> we, such we, a powerful we, observation. I, I cannot just uh, come out of these things. It is. Thank you. And it is still is. I think this is what we needed. We need now. We all have to reflect our privilege and talk about what, yeah. how we are complicit in the system. Yeah. Yeah, look at the uh, look at the lands they they owned. Who owned? Always the upper caste Hindus or upper caste Muslims. Who owned the land? Who tilted the land? That they till the land. Who were they? Their farmers were always lower caste. Yeah. I remember you know, we had a large land in our village in UP and uh, we know the system. And the system has changed, but how much has changed? Anyway, thank you. We are not. Yeah, we, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. Okay. Yeah, we will, we will come with the Muslim part, you know. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Who will take this part? I will. I will say that who will take that bet, you know, come with the Muslim part. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thank, thank you. you very much.